everybody. Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. Look at the person closest to you and say, I'm glad you're here. Amen. Our children can be dismissed. I guess there's no use to be dismissed tonight. But our kids can be dismissed. Amen. This is going to be one of those nights where my neck gets a good workout. The middle section looks very lonely. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, if we could turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. To let you know, uh, in my Bible reading, I I try to keep a um, a consistent. I have a list on my phone of of where I'm at to in my read through of this uh, of the Bible. But a lot of times, I it takes me a long time to get straight through the Bible because from day to day, I'll go and just read different parts. And when I don't know what else to read, Brother Shirty, I go back to the list and say, okay, what's next on the list? And I read that. But if the Lord is leading me somewhere else or if I'm studying something, I, I go to where the Lord is leading me. And uh, and I, exactly, random reading. And I feel like that can be very beneficial, especially as you're praying and being led of the Lord. And I feel like the Lord led me to this passage in Acts chapter 17. I texted Brother Shirty earlier today. And I asked him, I said, have you ever heard a Christmas message from Acts 17? And he said, not a one. And so, by the help of the Lord tonight, we are going to explore this passage in Acts 17. I'm just going to read four verses of Scripture, starting at verse 24. Acts 17 and verse 24 says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times, and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord. Everyone say, seek the Lord. And in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him. That they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. I was captured by this phrase, seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. And that phrase is also translated to feel their way toward him or, or to reach out for them. But it's the, the same imagery of uh, a blind man in the dark looking and trying to find. It's the same imagery of someone who can't exactly reach something, but they're stretching out for it anyway. All my short people say amen. It's this imagery of going, and, and I'm just trying to get it, uh, of little Jakairi coming to Hannah and just, and just reaching his arms up. He's reaching. But the beautiful part about this passage is it says they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might reach for him, feel their way toward him, grope for him, and find him. Amen. You may be seated. I don't exactly have a title for this. Um, I prayed and I wrote something in my notes, but um, I just, sometimes I don't find a good title. And so uh, whatever title stands out to you tonight, well, just put that in your notes, okay? Maybe the Lord will give me a title by the time I'm done. I want to start by just exploring the passage a little bit in the context. Uh, many of us have heard of Paul on Mars Hill. He's debating with the Athenians, 
They are philosophers, educated people. They are uh, very religious folks in a lot of ways. And Paul goes to their synagogues and he goes to their areas of worship. And Paul, uh, I almost get the imagery of him him just sneaking in like almost like he's a tourist or something because he's looking at all the altars and he's looking at all the statues. I imagine if he had a, a camera, he'd probably be taking little pictures, just, you know, looking around and seeing what he could see. But in the context of Paul's visit, he's not just there to see things. He's there to see how he can witness effectively to the people in Athens. And so when you study this passage here in Acts chapter 17, you see that Paul finds an altar. And on the altar it says, to the unknown God. To the unknown God. And, and the reason this is so intriguing to me is because in the Greek mindset, there was a large pantheon of gods. There were just all these different gods, and they were gods of different elements, and gods of the air, and gods of the sea, and gods of this, and gods of that, gods of war, and gods of peace. And they had all these gods, and, and in their mindset, they wanted to make sure that they honored all the gods effectively. And so just to cover their bases, and just to make sure they didn't leave anyone out, they erected an altar to the unknown god. So I guess in their order of sacrifices, they'd be going down the line and say, here's the sacrifice for, for Zeus, here's the sacrifice for Diana, here's the sacrifice for Hermes, here's the sacrifice for all these other gods, and just in case I left anyone out, here's the sacrifice for the unknown god. Paul observes this and uses this as the starting point for his sermon and says, you're looking for an unknown God? Well, let me introduce him to you. You're looking for a God because you want to make sure you don't leave anyone out. Well, let me introduce you to the one that you're ultimately leaving out. The one who the Bible calls the God of gods. Right? The Lord of lords. The King of kings. Let me introduce you to the one who is above all of these other gods that you are worshiping. In other words, Paul says, let me take the unknown God and make him known to you. Let me take God and move him from the realm of the, no, of the unknown and move him into the realm of the known. And for those of you who are thinking of the Christmas story in the back of your mind, you can already see the direction that I'm going. He said, let me take this God that has previously been unknowable to you and move him to a place where you can know him. Now, I think it's important to note as we read this passage that some, not all, but some of the philosophers and worshipers in the Areopagus there in Athens, I believe, that some of these seekers were very sincere. And let me explain to you why I think that. First of all, at the end of the passage, a good chunk of them were converted. So I do believe that some of the people who showed up there at Athens were genuinely seeking the one true God. They were genuinely seeking a God that would be known to them and, and, would, and would touch their lives in a way that all these other gods had not. And for the first reason, I think, is because the, the Athenians, uh, some of them believed him. Some of them were converted. It was a small amount, to be sure, but some of them were sincere. And the second reason is, I believe that some of them were sincere precisely because they had an altar to the unknown God. In other words, they were so concerned about getting worship right that they said, let me go above and beyond even what I know. Now, granted, they were wrong, okay? I understand that. But putting that theology for aside, look at the motivation. They were searching. 
with sincerity, saying, I want to know this unknown God, and I will worship him even though I don't know who he is, even though I don't know him in his fullest. And so as I was studying this and beginning to understand, I had a different perspective on the verse in Acts 17 that says, that all the Athenians spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. And that gave me a new perspective. And I do believe that the majority of these people were just there for vain discussion. I believe that. But I believe the reason some of them were there and telling something new and seeking something new is because they were seeking a genuine experience. They were seeking to know what was previously unknown to them. I imagine that some of them came regularly to hear the theological discussions, to hear the, the interactions that they had because they just wanted something real and something genuine. Again, many of them were just there because they enjoyed the debate. But some, the ones who were converted, the ones who heard Paul and received the message, those were the sincere believers. So that is my way of introduction to this lesson tonight. I want to focus in this lesson on three aspects from Paul's message. Three aspects. Because as I was studying this, and as I was hearing Paul's explanation of who God is, I found some very important details and lessons about the God that we serve. Some very important lessons about the nature of God. Some very important lessons about who we worship and what he is seeking for. Listen to this. The first thing, one of the first things that Paul points out to these people, and again, I'm still in the Christmas mood, okay? So we're thinking about this in terms of God. God who is and was this incarnation, right? He is and was and continues to be, right? The same yesterday, today, and forever. So the revelation that Paul gave to the Athenians applies to God for all time. Listen, he said that God does not dwell in a temple made with hands. This is the first thing that Paul wanted them to understand. You are coming here to this, what they consider to be sacred ground. You have an altar that's been built to this God. You are seeking him. But one thing you have to understand is that God does not dwell in a temple. He does not dwell in the confines of human understanding. Even in the Old Testament, hear me, they had the Ark of the Covenant. They had the tabernacle. They had the temple. But what happened every time Israel abandoned the God that they served? Well, God went and showed up somewhere else. He wasn't confined to that box they called the Ark of the Covenant. He wasn't confined to the beautiful robes that covered the tabernacle. He was not confined by that. And in a very prominent example, and, and this is something that I feel I'll probably preach in a month or two, but the Lord's working on it. So preview, right? When the, when the Israelites brought the Ark of the Covenant into battle with the Philistines because they thought the presence of God would defeat their enemies, God was not with them. And the ark got captured because the idea and the symbol of the presence of God is not equivalent to actually having the presence of God. The imagery of having God in your midst is not the same as actually having a proper relationship with him. Now that's a side note. That's a preview. 
coming soon to you in a pulpit, 2020. Amen. Even in those contexts, God was not confined to temple walls. He was not confined to certain places. God did what he pleased where he pleased. And in the worst part of Israelite history, God kept popping up in pagan lands. You realize God spoke to Balaam? We have this great idea of Balaam. Balaam was a pagan Gentile prophet. He wasn't an Israelite. But God showed up and spoke to him. And even spoke through his donkey. In, in the end of the Old Testament, God was showing up in the lands of the pagans and saying, hey, guess what? I got a people over here that's being disobedient. You got to destroy them. And so when the, the rulers came and the foreign powers, they besieged Israel, and Israel said, ah, oh, God's on our side. They said, I don't know what you were talking about, because Yahweh was just in our camp telling us to come destroy you. God showed up where he would. He showed up and spoke to people as he would. I would really encourage us to have this understanding of God, of God who does not dwell in temple made with hands. And in fact, the only temple that the Bible does say God dwells in are these bodies. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. We come to this church as a preordained, a God-ordained place where God can interact with us. But God is not confined to these walls. Here's the point. God shows up where he will. He shows up and manifests himself in ways that our preconceived notions can't even imagine. And probably the most powerful demonstration of this truth was at the first Christmas. Don't forget that in those times, everyone was looking for a messiah. Lots of people were looking for a Messiah. In fact, this is a bit of a side note, but there's a, 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 a textual variant. In other words, there's one ancient manuscript that has this wording, and there's another ancient manuscript who doesn't. Okay, But in the story of Barabbas, it says, uh, a pilot stands before them and says, do you want Jesus who is called King of the Jews, or do you want Barabbas? And in one of those ancient texts, for the Shirty, it actually says, do you want Jesus, who is called the King of the Jews, or do you want Jesus, who is called Barabbas? And he identifies both men as named Jesus. Because everyone was looking for a Messiah. And they chose a Messiah that they desired. Everyone was looking for a Messiah. And throughout the New Testament, people were questioning whether this person was actually the Messiah. What good thing could come out of Nazareth? Right? They saw his weakness. They said it couldn't be him. They, they said, I knew your dad. You can't be a god. Your daddy makes cabinets. You can't be divine. All these people had a preconceived notion of what God had to look like. That's why it's amazing to me that even though people knew the scriptures, remember, by the time they were 13, Jewish boys had memorized the first five books of the Bible. They knew it. If you got to be a scribe or a rabbi, you had most of the Old Testament memorized. And that's why when three wise men showed up in Herod's court, and they said, hey, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Where's the Messiah going to be born? The scribes quoted the scripture. And they said, oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And I know I said this in a message a couple, a few months ago. I can't remember when it was. But I said in that message, I said, if you knew that God was going to be born in Bethlehem, why wouldn't you be there waiting for him? That doesn't make sense to me. 
But even though they knew the scriptures, they had a very specific idea of how God had to show up in their circumstance. But God does not dwell in a temple made with hands. And he does not dwell in the temples of our preconceived notions. God can even show up, help me Jesus. (laughs) God showed up in a temple dedicated to Dagon. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter who's in charge of the temple. It matters if God's in it. It doesn't matter what the trappings of the exterior look like. What matters is if God's in it. And that's why God said, I don't care about your preconceived notions of how I'm supposed to show up. I don't have to show up in the temple of Herod as you are reading your Old Testament and forgetting about having a relationship with me. I don't have to show up in your pre-designed areas. I will show up to a virgin girl in a manger, in a dirty stable, because I will not be confined to your preconceived notions of who I am. And what's amazing to me, because so many people had already constructed a temple in their minds that God had to dwell in, they missed out When God made a temple out of a dirty stable. When God showed up to move miraculously in a small town. In a off the beaten track to people of no name and no visibility. We desperately need to avoid having these preconceived temples in our minds. We desperately need to avoid any mentality or idea that God has to show up in the way that I have decided He needs to show up. He is always working and He's always moving. But if we say that God has to do it and this, that, or the other thing, then we can miss out on a genuine move of God. I was listening to a sermon uh, from from uh, Brother Boyd's church in Hatchbin. I follow their podcast, and, and I was listening to one of their sermons the other day, and he said that. He said people are so concerned with, pers- with pursuing what they want to be a move of God, what they think God has to move in, that they miss Genuine moves of God. Let us never create this preconceived notion, this preconceived temple, and we say God has to move in this manner. How about this? The second point. So my first point, God does not dwell in the temple made with human hands. Second point, God made everything, including everyone. He has a master plan. You know that? He made all this. He wasn't surprised that he showed up in a manger. He wasn't surprised there was no room in the end. He wasn't surprised about the census that sent Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem in the first place. He wasn't shocked by any of that. He made the cows in the next stable over, stinking up the stable while Jesus was born. He made them. And that was part of his plan. He see, he did not just make the world, he also made the plan on how to save the world. He didn't just make you, he made the plan to save you. He didn't just make your world, he said, I'm going to make a way of escape and make a way of redemption for the world. And so in the passage we read, Paul said, hey, God don't need nothing. That's the Johnny Payton version. He said, God don't need nothing. He's the one who gives you what you need. And so, how foolish it is for us to have these these notions and these ideas that God has to work in a certain way. 
when God is saying, look, I planned all this. He's a better planner than we are. I don't know if anyone's noticed that in your walk with God. He's a better planner than we are. I've had a lot of plans in my life. I've had lots of 10-year plans that changed every two months. Right? Because he's better at it than I am. He knew how he needed to come to this earth. He knew that he wasn't going to show up in a grand, glorious fashion with, with trumpets and armies and, and angels coming down and conquering and slaying the Romans. He said, that's not how I'm going to show up. He said, you see, I got a plan. You know, that would have been too easy. I think, think, imagine this for a minute. Imagine this right now. If, if Jesus had showed up with a legion of angels, just slew every person in the Middle East who didn't believe in God, and said, all right, y'all, here I am. I'm the Messiah. Look at my crown. Look at my strength. Worship me. I think a lot of people would have worshipped him, to be honest. I don't think there would have been a lot of doubt in people's minds when this divine being showed up and started conquering their enemies and, and, and brought all their, all their horrible situations to an end. I don't know that there would have been a lot of doubt. But God said, no. He said, no. He said, I don't want to show up in such a way that people will not feel they have a choice to pursue me. I'm not going to show up in a manner so that people say, well, I, we have to. This is, this is under. No, he said he wants someone who can seek after him, grope after him, reach after him, and find him. See, God created this, this uh, uh, plan of salvation. Let me blow your mind another time. He created the Areopagus. He created the means for them to worship this unknown God. He created an atmosphere that Paul could show up and be a witness. When my father went to the land of the Eskimos, uh, my father, he planted many churches in Alaska. In fact, he was... Uh, in places where he was the first white person that some of them had seen. People forget, even in the 1980s, Alaska was still a very wild place uh, in, in many regards. And he met people who worshipped the great spirit. And he didn't argue with them. He just said, you want to worship a great spirit? Well, let me introduce you to the great spirit. Let me introduce you to the one. You say, well, how does that work? Well, what I'm saying is, is that God had laid the groundwork for him before he had even showed up. He said, the path is ready. The way is ready. He made an opportunity for them who would seek him to find him. For those who would be sincere in their pursuit, God made that. He orchestrated that. And this is my third point. So the first point, God doesn't dwell in temple made with hands. Second point, he made everything and everyone, and he made the plan, and he made the plan for the manger. He made the plan for him dying on the cross. He made the plan for your life. He made the plan for somebody to witness to you. He made that plan. So my third point, and I've already stepped all over it, but here it is. That God has pre-appointed these times, pre-appointed these interactions, pre-appointed these divine meetings, so that all of us here would have an opportunity to seek Him, to reach after Him, 
And not only that, but find him. This is not what some people would call preordination. Which basically means you have no choice and no free will. Instead, God designed our lives so that we would have the opportunity to find him. He designed our lives so that we would uh, be made and designed to seek after God and seek after something that's greater than ourselves. And so the passage says, he, predetor- uh, he determined their pre-appointed time and the boundaries of their dwelling. In other words, he knew exactly when you were going to live, where you were going to live, and how he was going to reach out to you in your context. And in your life. And in your specific demographic and background and mindset. He said, I know how to reach out to you. I know how to give you an opportunity to find me. He said, I'm going to orchestrate it perfectly. So that we're going to have an interaction. I will have an interaction with the people who are pursuing after me. He orchestrated our lives So that not only we would seek him, but we would find him. See, many people seek, but they do not find for one reason or another. Some do not find because they don't like what they find. And so they keep looking. Some people seek, but they do not find because they are seeking for their own preconceived notion. Some are seeking for the wrong things, or they have different ideas of what God is going to do. I find it very interesting, the story of the people who found Jesus at his birth. See, from the very moment Jesus came, it became obvious who was looking for him. It became very obvious who had it in their minds that I need the Messiah. And those who said, no, I'm not open to what God is trying to do. It was obvious who was looking for the Christ. See, there were two groups of people who showed up at Jesus' birth. And these two groups... Are, if this isn't telling of the God that we serve, I don't know what is. The first group that we hear about is shepherds. Let me tell you something. Shepherds were not exalted people in Israelite society. They were dirty. They were unclean. Right? They, they were out there working with, 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 with rough animals. They were out working in the fields with their hands. You have to understand, in that day and age, already the people were 95% illiterate, okay? That's the, that's the age. That, I mean, that's the mindset for that time frame, okay? 95% of people couldn't read. That was for the, the educated people and the rich people. Most people, they couldn't read. And these people sure couldn't. Out in the field, just taking care of the sheep. They weren't in some glorified position. They were the low points of society because they were working with a lot of animals and they were working with with dirtiness and whatnot. They didn't have the access to some religious things that the rest of Israel had. And so the shepherds, the lowest, the dirtiest, The poorest. Some angels showed up. They said, hey. I saw you over here. Dirty. Poor. Marginalized. And guess what? There's a Messiah. That's being born. Amongst animals. Hey. You who are working. Amongst the animals, guess what? Your God is being born amongst animals to save you from your sins, to provide you peace and comfort 
that you haven't received otherwise. And so at the moment of Jesus' birth, the angel says, who are we going to go to? We could go to the scholars, but they already know he's coming. Oh, in Jesus' name. We could go to the religious elite, but they already have the information. They've been reading the RSVP for a thousand years. Hello? Let me go to the people who haven't been to temple for a while. Let me go to the people who flunked out of their bar mitzvah. Let me go to the people who don't have the entire Old Testament memorized. Let me go to those people and say, hey, I know that you want a genuine experience that society has denied you. So come. Come and worship him. That was the one group. You know who the other group was? Gentiles. Oh, Jesus' name. Foreigners from the east showed up. It was apparently obvious that they were foreigners. They showed up. They're, they're called wise men. They're called different things. Whatever they were, they certainly weren't Jews. Whatever they were, they certainly wouldn't have been allowed in the temple. Whatever they were, they certainly wouldn't have been allowed in the religious rituals of Israel not with how the Pharisees were running things and the Sadducees were running things. Instead, wise men. Get this. Star worshipers. They worship nature. They were astrologers. They spent their time looking at the sky and nature revealed to them that a Messiah was coming for them. These were not people who had spent their time reading the Old Testament. If we encountered someone like this today, they would be the picture of a pagan. And yet they showed up with such faith and dedication and passion that said, I will get on my beast of burden and travel across the known world after a beam of light in the sky. So Jesus showed up to a bunch of dirty shepherds and some Gentiles. That's how Jesus showed up. Listen. Paul said it in the passage we read that he pre-appointed the time. He knew the boundaries of their dwelling so that they would seek the Lord they would find him and they would discover the end of verse 27 in Acts 17. He is not far from each one of us. He is not far from each one of us. If you're seeking, you can find him. Doesn't matter your background. Doesn't matter your history. Doesn't matter how much people are against you. Doesn't matter your disqualifications. Doesn't matter whether you're a shepherd or a Gentile or a pagan star worshiper. God can show up. He can show up if you're worshiping a bunch of pagan gods in a Greek temple. He can show up. He can show up to Gentile Cornelius' house because he sees the sincerity of his heart. He can show up in the wildest of situations. But if you've already made a temple that he has to fit into, you're going to miss it. He will not live in a temple made with hands. But he'll show up where people are looking for him. For the people who are looking not to hurt anymore. For the people who are seeking forgiveness for sins that seem overwhelming. For people who are who are seeking acceptance in a world that has not accepted them. For people who are looking for belonging 
when all the things they've tried just haven't given them that sense. People who are looking for understanding, people who are looking for healing, people who are seeking deliverance. There's a reason that Jesus said he doesn't show up for the people who think they're well. He says the well don't need a physician. Why do you think I'm hanging out with all the sick folk? The healed in their temples don't need me. They've got it all together. The religious elite, oh, they've got it all figured out. They know what's going on. He said, but I'm going to show up to the people who are seeking me with sincerity. Amen. Let's all stand. I want us today to rethink our expectation of how Jesus is going to show up in our situation. We love the story of the Christmas season. Listen to me, because we already know it. We know how he shows up. I read the book. He showed up in a manger as a baby. I, I know the story. I read it. Right? Let me tell you something. He is still showing up in unexpected places. In the name of Jesus, he is still showing up in areas that you were not expecting him to show up in. He's still manifesting himself in ways that will be surprising to us. And I thank God for the Christmas season. But the Christmas season reminds us of the nature of our God. The Christmas season reminds us of how He loves to work in our lives. The Christmas season reminds us that He can show up anywhere in the worst part of your life, in the dirtiest part of your life, in the part where you don't want guests to go there. That's for the animals. You don't want people to see that part of your life. That's for the, the people who get to stay in the end. I don't want to show you this aspect of my life. That's where we keep the filth. That's where we keep the rough stuff. That's where we keep the shepherds. That's where we keep the Gentiles. That's where we keep all the stuff that we want hidden. And God says, uh-uh. That's where I'm showing up. I'm showing up for the tax collectors hiding up in trees. I'm showing up for the fishermen who are swearing and nude out in their boat. That's who Peter was. He says, I'm coming for you, you dirty reject. With all your problems, with all your issues, that's where I'm showing up. Jesus name. Jesus name. If I would challenge us to do anything, and this might sound cliche, but I mean it, is to expect the unexpected. To start looking for God in the places you don't expect Him. We expect God in this service, and guess what? He shows up in this service, and that's a good thing. I expect for him to show up every time. Every now and then, though, he likes to change my preconceived notion of where he's going to show up. And he'll show up on a car ride when I'm feeling down and alone. He'll show up when I'm making dinner and he reminds me of something that I forgot from years ago that I read in his word. He'll show up in a conversation with someone that's not even spiritual. But he'll show up to remind us, hey, I'm still here. If you look for God in the unexpected places, guess what? You'll find him. He's still showing up in stables. 
He's still showing up for Gentiles. He's still showing up for tax collectors. He's still showing up for Ethiopians in the middle of a desert. He's still showing up for Cornelius's. He's still showing up for women at wells. He's still showing up in all the places that we didn't think he would. The God of unexpected places. That's the title. God of unexpected places. In the name of Jesus. Let's all find a place to pray right now. I would encourage some of us to come to this front. You can pray wherever you'd like. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to shame you. What I want you to do is find God in the unexpected place in your life. And say, God, that's where I need you. That's where I want you. I expect you in this service, oh God. But I want you to show up in all the areas of my life. Show up in the areas I didn't think I needed help. Show up in the areas that I didn't know. Lord, you were going to do it like that. Lord, show up in the unexpected places. Because he's the God of unexpected places. Amen. Let's pray.